This is a part of a series tackling the question of private property in the Soviet Union. If you're interested, please keep watching the next videos in the series after this video ends. Enjoy! I have often seen that a common Marxist defense of the Soviet Union is that it did not have private property, thus negating class antagonism that often beset capitalist systems. Hence, by upholding such a principle, the Soviet Union is often cited as having faithfully pursued socialism with the ultimate goal of having a classless society. The reason is that Marxism often holds the principle of the dialectic, a process of interaction between competing forces that results in a higher stage of development. This way of argumentation has existed for thousands of years, starting with Socrates' Meno, in which he argues the concept of virtue with Meno. As they progress, their arguments become more refined and more sophisticated in a somewhat evolutionary way. Marx basically transplanted this evolutionary way of truth-seeking with materialist elements, uh, as every 19th century ideologist would do. Marx sees the historical process of proceeding through a necessary series of modes of production characterized by class struggle culminating in communism. What this means is that the current economic system would have a sort of internal conflict that would then change or evolve the system into something else. To Marx, this was called communism, the final stage of the evolutionary cycle. Sorry, Fukuyama. By briefly outlining dialectical materialism, one can see the increasing importance that private property is played in Marxist ideology, as it causes the class conflict and antagonism in capitalist societies. If it were to exist in the Soviet Union, it would inadvertently undermine the legitimacy of the government, as it would admit to operating under a capitalist system. So just like with Mino's first conversation with Socrates regarding virtue, so too would the Soviet Union find itself starting at square one of the historical materialist dilemma. Historical materialism is just a concept explaining the development of society, first from hunter-gatherer societies to feudalism, then to capitalism and finally to a socialist transitionary period with the ultimate stage being communism. Each lower stage was riddled with class contradictions that would propel the system forward one stage. The odyssey of private property in the Soviet Union starts with the Russian Civil War, which saw the complete fracturing of the former Russian Empire. If you want to find out more about this gruesome and horrific episode in Russian history, then please check out my playlist titled Soviet Nations, The Russian Civil War. The Bolsheviks, later known as the Communists, retained power in the former Russian Empire, which had a large industrial base to work from. Because of this, the highly urban ideology placed a degree of emphasis on private property, culminating in a decree that abolished private property on October the 26th, 1917, right as they were taking power from the Russian provisional government. Initially sitting well with the peasantry, the communists proceeded to socialize all of the land of the Russian Federative Soviet Socialist Republic in January 1918. They also abolished inheritance in January 1918, but with caveats. Most banks were also nationalized on December the 17th, 1917, as well as church land and joint stock companies in June 1918. This, however, did not mean that all industries were nationalized, as that mainly depended on the size of the enterprises, as stated in a November 1920 decree. Now, the Bolsheviks were never fans of the peasantry, whom they regarded as backward, as attested by the 1917 vote of the Constituent Assembly, in which most peasants actually voted for the socialist revolutionaries, and not the Bolsheviks. The peasants wanted land and were preparing for a large-scale land redistribution, hence the Bolsheviks cautiously facilitated this process. Thus, as the landlord's property was distributed, three million previously landless peasants received some land. By 1919, for practical purposes, all agricultural land was in their hands. 
Although much of this was due to a lack of Bolshevik influence in the countryside, evidenced by the need to create the committees of poor peasants, known as the Kambeti, it did signal the first major private property episode, where land was redistributed to peasant families via the peasant commune, which was more collective in nature. With the passage of the 1918 Russian constitution, the Bolsheviks even disenfranchised merchants and those earning interest among others. However, given the structure of peasant communes, can one really say that private property didn't exist? As stated by Gregory Fries, there was much fervor among the peasantry before the Bolshevik seizure of power in 1917. The peasants shared a fundamentally revolutionary, not liberal, conception of law and justice. Land should belong to those who actually cultivated it not the landlords and speculators who merely prevented this rational distribution of land. At face value, this seems to support Article 4, 64b, and c. And while the civil war was raging, conflict arose between the peasantry and the Bolsheviks. The latter needed to ensure the continuation of the war, and thus resorted to liberal measures such as the requisitioning of foodstuffs, market raids, as well as roadblocks. Now the peasants couldn't even sell their own surplus, further deteriorating them from increasing their productivity. But even then, there was conflict within the ranks of the Bolshevik government, with Vladimir Lenin wanting to mimic a sort of German-style Junkers economy, with certain state monopolies being akin to what people would call state capitalism. All these measures did was to create a black market that would fill in the supply gaps via bagmen known as Meshochnitsi, and they also fomented insurrection in the countryside in the form of green peasant armies in regions like Tambov. But it was not only the countryside that was pissed. Industrial and agricultural output were sharply decreasing all across the board, causing worker strikes across the core of Russia. All metrics of economic output were essentially below their pre-First World levels, with inflation running rampant in support of the shadow economy. Some of the economic output didn't even reach pre-First World War levels until the early 1960s. The situation got so bad that it would culminate in a widespread famine from 1921 to 1922 that would go on to claim millions of lives. The American Relief Administration, run by the future US President Herbert Hoover, had to even step in with food aid. I wonder why the US was never mentioned as an enemy during Stalin's purges. And worst of all, this was happening when the Civil War was all but over, with the only viable opponent being a uh, Genghis Khan lookalike, Ungern von Sternberg, all the way in Mongolia. Due to these factors, by March 1921, many Red Army sailors stationed on the island of Kronstadt, off the coast of Petrograd, enacted open rebellion against the Bolsheviks, essentially wanting to end what they deemed as war communism. They sang to the name of anarcho-syndicalists and socialist revolutionaries. The workers and peasants steadfastly march forward leaving behind them the bourgeois constituent assembly with its bourgeois regime and the dictatorship of the communist party with its cheka and its state capitalism whose hangman's noose encircles the necks of the laboring masses and threatens to strangle them to death at the same time the 10th party congress of the communist party was underway with fervorous uproar about the current state of russian politics Figures like Alexandra Kollontai led what was known as the Workers' Opposition, a bloc in the Communist Party that opposed the centralization of power instituted by Trotsky and Lenin. This was ironic, as Trotsky actually held the belief of the spontaneous revolution in his youth. Don't even get me started on Lucarin. And although Lenin himself showed a degree of skepticism for war communism, the Communist Party went ahead and crushed the rebellion, the workers' opposition being included in this grotesque escapade. The situation between war communism and Lenin's Junkers economy lay in a lack of a Marxist response in how to best tackle the economic development of Russia. 
For example, in 1881, Marx famously gave a very ambiguous response to activist and would-be assassin Verisusslicht, in which he sort of states that Russia could skip the capitalist stage of development directly to socialism because of, you guessed it, peasant communes. The analysis in Capital therefore provides no reasons for or against the vitality of the Russian commune. Hmm. I don't know about you, but to me that's pretty clear. Anyway, enough quotes. In essence, this all explains the wishy-washy thinking of Lenin on how to best tackle the situation. And because of the insurrections and disorder occurring all over Eurasia, the 10th Party Congress passed measures banning party factionalism and the workers' opposition. Sorry, Alexandra. The 10th Party Congress also did something else that would radicalize the political landscape of Russia. The party reintroduced market forces to the economy, otherwise known as the New Economic Policy. And although the abolition of private property was indeed attempted, at least on paper, the reality was that market forces continued to penetrate the economy, especially in the countryside where communist control was lacking. I hope you all enjoyed this video. It took quite a lot of research, video editing, and scripting to complete. Given this, I have launched a channel fundraiser in order to help cover book costs and in order to allow me more time to do what I love most, Russian history. For every dollar that is pledged, you would essentially be allowing me to dedicate a further four minutes to the channel per month. So for a simple pack of gum, you would be allowing this channel to become financially independent. Anyways, thanks to everyone who watched this and especially to my patrons for helping these videos be possible.